Good evening, everyone, and welcome to to our BTS Young Members Lecture for April. It's uh, quite a nice turnout, uh, a full house. So, Matt, Ben, how do you feel about that? Congratulations already. <laughs> anyway, so today's lecture is titled uh, London Underground Houston Station Enable Works and Tunnels for High Speed 2 and Challenges in Design, Construction and Innovations. Um, our first speaker for tonight will be Ben. Ben, uh, first of all, congratulations for your chartership. Excellent. Thank you very much. So Ben is a structural engineer from the Polytechnical University of uh, Valencia, if I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, about 10 years of experience. And uh, he has uh, fo been focusing on tunnels. Uh, and his design work involves uh, projects in Baku, Doha, Hong Kong. Uh, lately, he's working with mods uh, on projects like Tideway and High Speed 2. Um, yeah, so the stage is yours. Well, hi. Thank you, George, for your kind words. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with our friends and colleagues from the BTS. Uh, for us, I think for Madam, for me, it's a uh, and we are very happy to be able to, to show this amazing and interesting project that we had the privilege to, to work with, to work at, actually. Um, so I will be starting with an introduction of the user station tunnels, and then I will be focusing in the design challenges and the innovations. I will try to focus in the most interesting aspects of the design, so I won't be talking much about London clay, or a excavation method. Then I will be handing over to, to Matt to talk about the construction. And finally, some takeaways of sustainability and, and lessons learned. So first of all, I would like to introduce the project. The project is a part of the High Speed 2 Enabling Works scheme and is based in, in Houston Station. Uh, we started the little design with uh, with Constein Skanska JV, very good collaboration, and then Nesra Gados took over and uh, we finalized the design together and, and they built the the tunnel. <coughs> we'll be focusing, of course, about the tunnels and the temporary shaft. However, this is a very multidisciplinary um, project. There are so many other aspects, but I will be focusing on the tunnels today. Well, most of you might be familiar with uh, this picture. This is the current status of the, this is Houston Station uh, right now. And sometime in the future, there will be an extension for, for, the, for the terminal station for HS2 in Houston, which will be covering, it works. Maybe it doesn't work. Anyway, so it will be covering the, Oh, that's fine, it's just a laser. Yeah, so the extension of the Houston extension, uh, Houston station will be happening in the left-hand side of this footprint in between the, the red lines, inside the red lines. And uh, due to that, all of this area had to be demolished, which currently is. However, there's a small building there which cannot be demolished yet because is the, it's the existing headhouse, which provides ventilation and fraction to the existing uh, London, London underground lines underneath Houston. For that reason, and before demolishing that building, a new one had to be built outside the footprint over there, new headhouse, and then uh, the tun a tunnel to be built from the new headhouse to the existing assets underneath the existing one. Um, commission, the commission, of course, before that can happen. So this is the overall view of all the LU assets in the Houston area, Houston Station, to align the two branches of, north, of the Northern Line. And we'll be focusing in this small circle. That for us, it was very big, but in this, <laughs> here looks really small. So that's the ventilation and substation, which is to be demolished, and all the associated underground uh, passages, galleries, shaft, etc. So our project consists in, as 
I said before, uh, building a new head house on the right-hand side of the, picture, of, the, of the slide, and two tunnels. So we will be starting the project from the temporary shaft. Okay. And then there will be a long tunnel connecting the temporary shaft to the new substation, and then a short tunnel which will be connecting to the existing infrastructure, existing assets. This is the way you look in the design. This is quite remarkable, and you, you might have seen this picture before. So this is the facade of the, or, or how it will look like in the future, the new substation. Of course, we are tunneling in central London, so we have all the issues associated with that. One of the biggest one is the amount of stakeholders and you know how constrained the space is. We were lucky that our tunnel happened to be up, uh, below a uh, demolished area, so we didn't have too much problems with the monitoring, but the new head house, the box, this is a picture taken a few months ago, was uh, dealing with, with, this, with these issues. Maybe Matt will extend on the question, we can speak about that. Um, so I relate these two pictures because that uh, highlight the amount of different assets or, or basically um, methodologies of design and construction that were involved in this project and that made it, that made it very, um, uh, it felt really good to be able to design all of those things and I guess to, to build as well. So we have uh, head walls, we have curved tunnels, we have connections, parent child, parent and child connection with SEL, we have segmental lining shaft, we have cast in situ concrete, so it was uh, quite a broad um, aspects in within tunneling. And then focusing about the design, I wanted to expand about the three most interesting challenges or issues we had to, to deal with. So as I explained before, we were to commission the tunnel before anything can happen above it. Then at some point there will be an excavation for the new Houston station and that's the basement. That uh, slab for that slab is it will be in between two and three meters thick just to have a, a scale and it will be to a minimum of one meter of cover or the, the distance is, is just one meter. Then it will be a load also applied over it. So you can see that this tunnel is going to be subjected to a very different scenarios of loading throughout the design or so the, uh, the, the lifespan of the of this structure. So this is the first challenge, like how we define, how we design that, we need to consider that. And this is gonna be one of the main drivers in our relatively uh, simple or, or standard tunnel shape and diameter, but whose conditions made this design really challenging. This is that some of the construction stages, cam clay model, it was really needed to, to get a very detailed, um, very detailed uh, calculation on, on that. And then at some point, we will have the excavation almost <coughs> to the crown. That involves obviously a very big heat. And um, squatting effect, you know, the over consolidating uh, and very high pressures in the horizontal direction. Nothing in the crown, so that would be the, the formation to be expected. And then once the, the Houston station is built and also an, uh, over, uh, uh, a development above of between 15 to 20 stories is to be built, so it will be a very uh, high load applied in the tunnel. So that was the main challenge. This is an image of how the heat for this uh, excavation um, stage impact in the tunnel. We had a maximum, according the, the we, this is together, these calculations together with the, uh, with the Houston station designers. A uh, maximum heat of 45 millimeters in one of the stages. And of course, at some point, the, the excavation finished, and then we have almost no heat. That was very challenging, as you can imagine, how to deal with this differential movement. For that, what we did, and I will spend what we did, uh, well, all the things we have to, 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 to do uh, for this, but we had to design a, a large set of construction joints and so movement joints in order to accommodate this differential movement. This is some details about the construction joints and the movement joints we had to design, which were able to take up to 20 to 30 millimeters of displacement, vertical displacement. 
as you can see in the image on the right, all the bays, and, uh, and in each bay you ha we had this this setup of uh, of movement joints. The second challenge is the next one is when you load it. Uh, up there you can see a heat map or basically the load in one of the um, uh, load combinations coming from the from the Houston station, and this is our our design loads. You can see there's a maximum of 465 kilopascals applied directly into the crown when previously we had almost nothing. 465 kilopascals is four double-decker double buses applied, that, that weight applied in each uh, square meter. So, so you have an idea how massive the load is. And due to that, you can imagine that did that require uh, unusually um, reinforced lining? Not only that, but also a very thick lining compared to what we could expect. That was pretty surprising for the contractor, also for the RCD tailor, until well, until they realized or we they, they we they convey the the reason why uh, that had to be so reinforced. So that really states how important is to the assurance process and how you pass the information from the design stage to the construction. And also we have to design all sorts of small details to accommodate the displacement, such as, for example, this intermediate wall which splits the ventilation area to the future cable area. And in order to accommodate these expected displacements, so we have to design also um, items to, you know, not to, that wall to break the lining because of the load. In a, in a future deformation. Then the second item I want to speak about is the connection to the existing asset, because it's the main important thing here, try to connect the new assets, the new infrastructure with the existing one. That has been done before, extensively in Crossrail or in bank and in other projects, but it doesn't mean that it's, uh, in each project obviously is, is, is quite a challenge and it has a specific issues to deal with. So what we were planning to connect, or the, the plan was to connect the, uh, with that uh, shaft, existing shaft, that would be a, the, our cable added, and then when a curved tunnel will be wrapping the existing lining and demolishing <coughs> the existing head wall. So our goal here was to provide the contractor uh, the best information we are in order to allow the, the construction to confidently start and, and basically to the contractor wanted to know what to expect. So what we had um, in order to design that, to design our little design connection. So we had scanners, we had point clouds, we have existing drawings, which were very helpful, and also existing uh, condition surveys. But of course, to design a detailed design connection, um, we need a bit more, so we have to design our own surveys, intrusive surveys like, like this one. And you never have enough surveys. And you want, we wanted to know so much things. So of course, that, that, that stage was very important in order to, to know how much, uh, what, how to design this, this, this asset. For example, here, we, were, uh, we wanted to know how thick was the head wall or what was the current state of the cast iron lining, uh, because uh, we have to remove the cladding, also try to find out whether there was a column there or not. So very simple things, but very important to give confidence to the contractor and to uh, allow the design to, to happen. Obviously, that has to be very well planned because you know, the, the owner of the asset doesn't want you to be all over the place breaking uh, things. So uh, what we gave the contractor, what we conveyed to the contractor was a set of drawings with, our mo with the most likely scenarios they could find, uh, and also with a design of the connection. And well, this is the result, or this is um, how the, the headboard was demolished, and the final uh, view from the new tunnel, and also from the other side, you can see the, the existing, he the, the existing headboard and how it looks now. The second connection, sorry, uh, also we have a very complex, uh, say, uh, detail. I think Matt will extend uh, about this. And yeah, well, this is, there was the most likely scenario. We designed the connection, 
However, something unexpected was found. So Matt will, will explain a bit later, but it, this is just speaks about how complex it is to design connections to assets that were there for 120 years. And this is the second connection. For example, the challenge we, we found here was that the status, on, the status well, you can see the status on the left. So this infrastructure wasn't prepared to, and the, to provide an, a new opening. And because of that, we have to design a um, brand new lining to make the other redundant and allow the connection to, to, be, to be formed. And finally, the third topic I wanted to, to speak today is the use of parametric modeling or parametric design. Uh, we believe that was the perfect project to, 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 to undertake this, not only modeling technique, but also a design workflow and methodology. And that involved, or the main goals for that was to achieve efficiency, to speed up the modeling process, and reduce abortive work that we were experiencing in previous projects. <coughs> also, uh, get some rel reliability owning the model, and ensure, or having assurance with a single source of, of truth. How this work? Well, better to show a video, how we do this. Let's say we were programming with algorithms, the subassets. All of these algorithms were linked to some inputs or our parameters. So for example, now what we want to do, we want to change the shaft opening of thickness and of coordinates. So in order to do something that before was taking hours or days of modeling and checking, due to this workflow, we could do that in seconds. You can see it's going to move the one on the left. There you are. Then it's not only that, we can, only, we can also link the geometry to the calculations and to make sure that our geometry is always uh, linked and, and associated with the calculation modeling, providing assurance and uncertainty. And also, of course, pro drawing production, being model, and allowing some value in engineering by means of being able to design with more iterations as it was very easy to, to change the, the geometry. Sorry, I think we'll have it rushed the video, but hopefully you do it right. Um, then, uh, what were the major challenges or why we used this or what was the benefits of this technique? First of all was um, the fact that we had to do a, quite, a, um, uh, quite a redesign already in the detailed design. So we didn't have time to for these iterations I was mentioning before. So the fact that we had this software or this method in place allowed us to uh, provide a detailed design in the program that we we have. Also, we were in an area where we, there were other parties in all the designs, for example, the spires or the or the base the base level of the station, which were in different. Um, were in different stages of development, and that meant changes, that meant new inputs, and we had to react very quickly to that. So that was this method also was very useful for this uh, easy reaction or this quick, uh, rapid reaction. And finally, <coughs> to deal with the knowns and knowns, we knew the connection had to happen, we knew how it would be, but the parameters were not confirmed because the service didn't come yet. So we could, uh, we could advance the design depending on the parameters that uh, subsequently we would implement and get the final design. And finally, just some take out of this, some, some fancy stuff. Uh, I remember like five, four or five years ago, we had to go to Fleet Place to go for them, to go and check this, this uh, with the digital team, check, uh, or check how would be our, our model with the, with the VR Googles, that felt really are really fancy actually, and now everyone can get this from 300 or 400 pounds and play this <coughs> video game. So that shows actually how quickly the industry, not only in tunneling but in general in engineering, how the industry is moving on with the time in the times of the AI, for example. And now I think I will be uh, handing over to Matt so he explain the construction of these channels. Thank you. Can I take the opportunity to introduce you then? Okay, thanks. So, 
I'm very happy personally to see Matt there because we, we've been involved in the project together. But anyway, Matt is a project manager in Dragaros and um, he also comes from a civil engineering background. Uh, he has uh, more than 15 years of experience in various roles and numerous projects, uh, including not only tunnels and uh, but also civils and roads. And yeah, Matt has gained his SEL expertise uh, in various high profile London underground projects, also in Crossrail and others. Uh, big ones in, in the London and the UK metropolitan area. So over to you, looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, and thank you, Van. Okay, um, yeah, so I'll take you through the construction of the tunnels. So as far as tunnels in London, I, I'm not gonna go too much into the detail of digging a shock route tunnel through clay because everyone will be bored of that by now after Crossrail and the LU projects. So, and also the tunnel here it, it was fairly straightforward, you know, it was 100 metres of tunnel uh, from, well, from the temporary construction shaft onto the existing assets and to the new piled box shaft. But there were, there were quite a few interesting little bits and pieces I'd like to share with you just for a, a lessons learned, really. Um, the, 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 the orange shaft was my favourite. That was 4968. I had about 100 sketches of that by the end. And joining on to the existing was quite fun as well. So <clears throat> the way I always start a project is to draw out a storyboard of it. So what we have is I have a library of all the plant. I can download those from the internet and sketch over them and make little diggers and things, which I quite enjoy doing. And then I import the PDFs from whatever the designer gives us. And then we scale it all up so that we can plot it all on a drawing so that we can, uh, I can work myself through and everyone else to see scale sizes and pretty much just work through a project so it's like building it virtually but you don't need to go to a 4d cad operator and ask him to give you something next week you can do it all yourself and it's very simple to do but when i was a kid i always liked lego um lego instructions and i always thought it'd be really good if i could uh you know do lego instructions for a living but i, I do this now instead <laughs> So, um, yeah, so basic storyboard. So each section of works, I'll go through and sketch everything. It looks like an awful lot of work, but it's quite enjoyable. And also because you've got the items already, it's cut and paste for most things and moving shapes around. So it doesn't actually take an enormous amount of time. But, yeah. But, and this was a simple project compared to some of them. So, yeah. Um, now, just you know, reiterate, the established industry practice, you know, you start off with your design drawings and uh, you get a 3D model if you're quite lucky and you get your specification from that. You then get your survey information, write your method statement and your ITP. And then once you've done your planning, then you do your construction with your required excavation support sheet. And then you build your tunnel. The thing is, is, this is very linear. There's there's a bit of to and fro going back to the design from the from the planning stage, but pretty much is one, two, three. Um, and also, your method statements are always far too wordy. Um, I'm really not very good at reading and digesting things. And other people pretend they are, but I'm not so sure. But with the with the storyboard, you get a lot more um, backwards and forwards to design because you've already been through a process of building it in your head. So you can go back to design and say, oh, actually, we would like to change this item now. Um, also doing workshops with the clients and the designers and, and the, the people building the, um, the, the tunnel, you know, they, they understand what you're getting at, what you're aiming for. You can then put these drawings into a method statements. Now your method statement is very visual as well. So it's a lot easier to communicate when you do come to construction, talking to the the people on site and also it adds on to the work plans or activity plans that we would like to call them nowadays um yes yeah, so i find it really really useful uh, and it also really blurs the lines between the design and the planning and the planning and the, the construction okay so on to construction so we had on top of the clay there was a there's always a band of water well usually in london and then we had the main grat ground and the gravels so it was decided to go through the first part of the shaft with this cation now as you can tell by the red and white Gallagher's uh, were our contractor and you know they've done hundreds of these so they, they can be tricky things if you haven't done them before but Gallagher's really know what they're doing here and they, they sunk that really well for us and uh, 
really nice construction there. But the best thing about it is it gets you through that water uh, band and makes sure you haven't got too much rushing in. So really good job there. I did do a animation, but I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> so <clears throat> right, um, the second half, the bottom half of the shaft here, because we had the tunnel eyes and also it flares out. Um, was originally to build it with steel fibres, but at the time of construction, it's just after the pandemic or during, I can't remember which, but there was supply line issues, so we really couldn't get any fibres. Now, you know, for the mix that we had approved, the fibres just weren't available. Uh, we, we looked at using different sizes of fibres, rerunning the trials, but they would take at least, at least a month to actually carry out and get the results, another couple of weeks to get a new mix approved. That hopefully if the test went okay if the flexural beams um, test went okay which they never do so um i think it was kate our engineering manager you know, i think i think everyone thought it was their idea but um i think kate said it first but it was to do it the old way and just do it with mesh so but still we're building a tunnel in london and we've got the end users london underground we've got hs2 and everyone else so Actually, doing a design change at last minute is really quite difficult. So, first thing we did was to, well, I did, was to sketch, or talk to the contractors as well, was to sketch out how we're actually going to install it with mesh. This, the idea of this is to make sure that you give everyone confidence, the designers, the stakeholders, the, the client, um, that not only it can be done with mesh, but also we know what we're doing and this is how it's going to be done. Um, but the devil is always in the detail with this, and so we also got some CAD drawings done by um, Adrian, uh, who really came up with detailed drawings where each sheet of mesh would end, and we were able to pass these on um, with, well, speaking to the Gallagher surveyor, um, pass these on to the site team who are working over shifts, so, you know, we need to get this communication through different people not who aren't there at the time just to make sure everything uh, goes as swimmingly as possible. And uh, we have a really good product that is good quality. Um, the de design change process though, um, just the admin for this is a nightmare, really, really is. You know, we have our technical change proposal, um, which we produced as the main contractor. This then had to be signed off by about four people in, in our organization. Then it goes through the designer Mots, then they have to pass it to Gals Idler to do the CAT3 check. We then have OTB doing our temporary state check on site. At the same time, we then have Gallagher's. They have to write the method statement, which again gets signed off by several people, lost count. And the inspection test plan as well, which again goes through several people. And this is all before we get to give it to the client, and uh, <coughs> which is HS2, and also London Underground, which is um, you know another another challenge, let's say, but, and then we can give it to the people on site to actually build the thing. So you know, normally this would take a long time, but we managed to get this done in two weeks, which was a real, real good achievement and, you know, re really good teamwork on this. But it just goes to show with people with the right attitudes and knowing what they're doing, you know, this can be achieved. This is two weeks for a, for a redesign. You're going from fibres to mesh, the designers are a lot more confident with it that uh, you know, it will flex a lot more, be stronger. But at the same time, just, just getting through the admin is a, is a challenge, let alone actually everyone pulling together and getting this done. So it's a really good news I'd like to share with you. Um, oh, and this is a, just a picture of the shaft. The, the top of the shaft where, where it flared out, uh, an unusual radius, you know, it wasn't easy to get in perfectly, but the the people we had on site, really good steel fixers, really good miners, uh, really good surveyors, and uh, you know, again, Gallagher's people did a really good job of that for us. And we ended up with something really good quality. Um, just to show it, it wasn't just a case of sticking two sheets and mesh together. There was the tunnel eyes and extra reinforcement through the eyes anyway, so there's a bit more to it. And there's a, there's a nice shot here of the tunnel eye. Hmm. Um, yep, so that was the shaft. And we came onto the tunnel, so like I said, it, it was fairly standard, 100 metres long, 6 metres diameter. It's basically dig and spray, top heading and bench. Uh, we got a fairly good steady rate, four advances a day. 
Uh, this was with the constraints of muck away, having to work inside an acoustic shed and so forth. And we constructed it with um, top heading and bench, and we're using the type A joints that we developed on banks. So we had um, a lot of the miners were the same people that we worked with on banks, so they, they were really good at doing those. So the tunnel went really well. Uh, just one thing to note, we were going to do it with a specialist excavator, but there was some problem that I don't remember. But we, because it was quite a short duration tunnel, we hired, well, Gallagher's hired this eight ton machine, which ha had the power um, to dig out and, and the, the space, and then they trim up with a road header. So it actually worked really quite well and did the job really well, so no problems there. Uh, uh, leading on to the back of the house, yeah. So um, if you get a Sentinel card, well, if you don't have a Sentinel card, you can go around Houston and do back of house tours for the disused tunnels, okay? But if you've got a Sentinel card and you sneak in and you say you're doing a survey, you can go down there yourself. So here's Adrian pretending to be a ticket inspector. Uh, the next, it, it was a really weird passage we saw, it was, uh, we found, um, I forget where it is now, but it was, it was kind of like doing a National Trust exploring the castles thing. Uh, this shaft here, th this photo really shows what it's like the back of house, you know, we have to make a, we have to put a cap on this shaft and build a column in the middle of it, and you can see how many cables and, and whatnot are in there. It's really quite fun. Adrian's been there for a few months drawing sketches of it. And there's, there's all the old pictures from the 60s when the station still first closed down, so West Side Story for those that can remember it. Uh, okay, so yeah, so it's just a taste of what back of house is like. Um, this shaft here, 896, is one that we had to connect to, but we had to strengthen before we got there. Uh, and then we were connecting to the, the, this tunnel on the other end as well. Uh, this section here of 4896, and the green is where we would strengthen the shaft up. Right. With the existing connections, you get these beautiful drawings from TFL, you know, the they're like 100 years old, some of them, and they're, they're really beautifully drawn. And, you know, you, you think about the drafts people back in the day drawing these and how lovely they are. And the detail on these, you know, it, it's really quite remarkable. So it really leads you into a false sense of security that these drawings are actually what people have built. <laughs> so this one here, this is 4986. So this is a drawing that says on there, you know, London Underground, Euston Station, Spiral Staircase. You know, so we go there. There's an old spiral staircase that's been taken out, and it's got these steels in, so everyone thinks, oh, this must be what the shaft is like. So this is the actual drawing and what we actually found. And so, you know, it's got this 600-thick cover slab. We found that to be about 300 thick. The diameter, you know, 5640, it's actually 160 mil smaller than that. So that makes you start thinking what, what's going on here. Landing level, yes, nothing like that. Um, the slab thickness at the bottom, you know, they're telling us that it's a metre thick, which you'd expect. We actually put some cores through it and we're getting 200 mil thick with loose rubble underneath it. And then the final ring isn't at the bottom of the shaft, so there's no hoop loads going around the bottom of the shaft and there's openings. Uh, and it was really lucky that we found that because, you know, we'd go down there and meditate and look at stuff and hit stuff with a hammer, try and do our surveys. Because, like Ben said, it's, it's really difficult getting a survey organised for the back of the house. But you know, given everything else that was wrong with the shaft that we'd found, it was let, let's dig a hole there and just make sure that that rings there. Because if it isn't, we're in real trouble. Um, but we've we'd done the check. And because we did the check before, we could then give that to designers to check everything. And we put in a few props and things like this. So that saved a bit of time, but it was quite lucky. But again, with this, the devil is in the deep. This is looking up from the shaft, so it's a bit dark, I would have brightened up. But you can s just about see the landing level there at the top of the shaft. And that was kind of leave it over onto, the, onto these steels. And you know, it's like, there was no design for this. You know, they'd obviously put these steels and said, oh, look, there's a piece of steel that we can put the beam over to. So they've just connected it. So the first thing we notice from standing at both bottom of the shaft obviously the only way you can get there at the time is through the station so you can't you know, get 10 meters in the air to have a good look so looking up quite a lot uh, 
they did do some surveys with some drones, but that was before our time. So we realized that we needed to put beam across, so we got the temporary works designers to design that beam for us. Uh, but then, <clears throat> when we actually got there to put the beam up there, we saw how bad the concrete was. It, it, it was all flaking away, and we couldn't put any vibration into the lower part of the shaft to do the work um, with people working underneath this because it was, it was really quite delicate. So we ended up having to put a, a crash deck all the way across, and uh, Helen had done this for us. And as you can see, we've built it exactly as per her temporary works drawing. It's a good job. Uh, yeah, and the bottom of the shaft here as well. There's a bit of a long story here, but when we actually came to break it out, there was a vent duct all the way to the running tunnels, which, you know, where you have to keep your one hour fire protection to the uh, to the life station it was a bit of a surprise. So we uh, you know, worked really well with TFL and uh, Gallagher's and we, we blocked up quite quickly, to stop that air passage through and get the fireproofing back in. Uh, but we, we had planned to do a shotcrete um, excavation at the bottom there. Um, and yeah, Gallagher's did a really good job of that for us in quite tight space. Um, this was the other connection. So the actual connection on the drawings here left this little tiny bit of a pillar, which comes back to Ben, where he's talking about the, the beam going across. By this time, we realized the beam was on a, on a jam frame. Um, and when, when we uncovered it, we noticed that the, the jam frame was a lot thicker than the rest of the tunnel. And we really <laughs> didn't want to take this out because of all the uh, structural issues we had. So we decided quite quickly after we'd uncovered this, um, you know, because this was for the ventilation airflow. So, so to get the ventilation f f flow through, we just shifted the tunnel out, redesign quickly. We shifted the tunnel over by 200 millimeters and then came up a way of waterproofing around the outside of, of the tunnel and then onto the face of the jam frame. And uh, again, you know, so it, to get the design change through, we did a lot of detailed sketches uh, to, to get things agreed so everyone could see what we were doing. We'd have TFL come down and inspect uh, uh, and, and agree stuff. Um, but this took five months to agree. <laughs> You know, where the other thing took two weeks, this was now five months. Um, I think the only difference being was that there was five months to use rather than the two weeks that we really needed. So it doesn't matter how easy you make it for people. I think t things will take as long as you give them. But, um, but yeah, it turned out nicely in the end. Um, yes, yeah, so as Ben was saying, the we built this tunnel but then we basically, when we come to build the main station, we have to dig down onto the top of the tunnel. Literally, we'll be scraping the, the, the top of the primary lining when we actually dig down. So there's good, and then there's a gravel layer for drainage. So there's definitely going to be a lot of water getting down through. Well, we won't even have to go through the clay. We'll be getting down. So rather than a waterproof membrane, it's specified that we have this sheet membrane. And we, uh, this is a Seeker product, and uh, Gallagher's engaged for UNESCO which a lot of us will know, and they did a really good job. Gallagher's did a really good job of the setting out here, uh, making sure everything's in the right place, getting all the joints in the right place. And Renesco did a really good job of installing it. Um, because of the amount of steel in here, like Ben was saying, anyone would think it was Kentilage. These are all like 32 mil bars, 25 mil bars to get in there. So normally you put your um, invert joint lower down but it was decided the best place to put it was up on, on the knee joint here. Uh, but it required a much larger shutter here, which uh, Gallagher's got from Doka. But that, that actually worked really well in getting the, the joint in the right place. And then, after, so we go through and cast all the inverts, and then go through and cast all the, well, finish off the waterproofing, then put all the rebar in, and that's it. So, and then cast, oh, sorry. And then cast the, <laughs> Cast the crown here um, with this Doka shot, and that, that works really well. And Ga Gallagher's men, they're really, you know, they've, they've done this before. We have some excellent carpenters with us and uh, an engineer, so really, really good job. And this is the finished product um, with the center wall in it. Okay. Um, <coughs> right. um, yeah, so that was constructing it, and then I just wanted to say a few words about the carbon savings. 
Uh, I was discussing this with Ben before as well. Um, the same way that we go through a project with the CDM regulations, seeing what safety things we can control and how we go through it like that. It, it, it's probably about time, given the situation in the world, that uh, a similar thing is done with carbon. Now, everyone tells me that you know we've gone through carbon savings and looked at things, but how much really? So. And e e even when I first looked at this, I wasn't thinking about the carbon. I was thinking about it would be cheaper to do it like this. So uh, originally during the design, you know, before when they're talking to Costains, uh, Mont McDonald had come up with, we'll break through the tunnel through the piles and then we'll backfill it with um, foam concrete so that when they dig the shaft, it'll be nice and safe. There won't be any problems with digging the shaft with stability. But, um, you know, if, if you do foam concrete because they're aerated, you need to... You do one metre pour, so there's and be a lot of shuttering, a lot of um, pumping concrete, a lot of deliveries coming in. Uh, you know, and e e even if we went for a week, uh, you know, sand cement mix and, and done it in one, it'd still be carbon that we don't need to burn deliveries. And it's it's not just putting the concrete in; you then need to break it out and get trucks to come and take it away again. So uh, we looked at, rather than doing that, we just changed the method and agreed that we'd control the method of excavation not to put any um, load onto the head wall while we're digging it and just dig it out and break it out. So this saved about eight tonnes of carbon, which, you know, isn't going to solve the climate crisis, but, you know, every, every little helps. And it also saved us money as well. Um, so, you know, why not? Um, you know, it's just a bit of control when you're, you're planning your works and showing everyone that you can plan and you can control your works by doing lots of sketches. Um, and th this is a picture of a tunnel that you never normally see because, uh, yeah. Um, the other carbon saving we had was, again, unintentional. We actually had a water main that was a one metre diameter water main that was installed in 1912 above us. And there's a quite good video on YouTube of this water main bursting in the 90s just because it was a hot day. And so people were nervous about us tunneling underneath it. Uh, the original scheme here... Uh, you can see in blue and red. Um, you know, we thought this would be best because you, know, you just build one tunnel and then the next and you move your shutter along. But we had to reduce the size of the excavation um, due to the water main, so we had less settlement. But actually in doing that, I, I sat down afterwards and just added up how much concrete we saved, uh, deliveries to site bringing concrete in, the amount of rebar we saved, um, you know, muck away, waterproofing, sheet membrane, fleeces, diesel for doing more tunnel works and, and the rest of it, and actually saved 143 tonnes of carbon. You know, had we have um, decided to do this in the first place, you know, actually thought about the carbon rather than how quickly and e easy it is to build. Uh, and also the price wouldn't have been very much different at all. So, yeah, just uh, think we need to think about carbon more, not just, oh, can we use a weaker concrete with less cement in? which really isn't good for shock freezing or tunnels that need to last 150 years. But they're just methods that there is a lot of savings can be done. Okay, so summary. So, you know, I, my recommendation is you sketch everything out on a storyboard. Uh, make it very easy to, for people to give you what you want when you're asking for something. You can make your proposals really clear. Um, don't trust ancient as built. Um, yeah. uh, consider the carbon and also enjoy your colleagues' company because um, you know it is about the people here. And uh, there's some really nice folks. Tim here, he's our he was our steel fixer. He's always smiling. You can imagine how much fixing steel he had to do there. It was really quite difficult, but always smiling. And Daisy and Niall and uh, Miss Vera, I don't know. But um, <laughs> the things. You're all here tonight, and the older you get, the more people you, you'll get to know. And I think a lot of you come here for the drinks to see your old friends as well, uh, rather than my wonderful talk. But, um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much, and thanks for all coming. It's good to see you. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Ben. Uh, very interesting stuff. So now it's the time for questions. Uh, also, that goes for our online attendees. So for the online attendees, please drop your questions in the chat box. We'll address them if we if we like them. So over to you. 
Hello, uh, Beth and Dr. Sarah and partners. Um, your sequence, Matt, had design and then survey and then construction. Um, given that when I say survey, I mean setting out. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I mean the surveyors. We call them surveyors. Okay. Yes, because uh, yep. there is a certain element of struggle in getting survey, particularly as you say in a working station. Um, how would you uh, communicate? more to the clients, the importance of survey for future projects interacting with these existing assets? Yeah, with the survey, it's incredibly difficult. Um, it's, it's really difficult to do a survey because you're on a live asset. And if you're with the client, especially LU, they really don't care about you. Um, the, the way to look at it is when we were working on Bank Station, you know, 700 million pound project. And it was enormous, and for us, it was the world for a good few years. Um, but when you step back and look at the look at the tube network, if you're in charge of the tube network, and you look at it, it's you know Bank Station, seven hundred million. It's the equivalent of Buckingham Palace having a new utility room put in, and they're there to run trains. So it's very difficult. Um, to answer your question, Beth, and. <coughs> You need to show them the cost of not doing the survey. You know, we, we were really lucky here. That you, you, we were just connecting to a tunnel, and the survey could have cost us a lot of money. You know, if we'd have, if we hadn't have discovered that missing ring until we were there with the machines to do it, and then had to come up with a, uh, a, a, a you know, solution around that, we we could have been stopped for several weeks. Uh, you know, tens of thousands of pounds a day. Um, and at, at the same time, when you are planning your surveys, you really want to just go down there with a drill and a breaker and say, I'm going to break holes everywhere in a scanner and just say, I'm going to break holes wherever I am. Because you, you'll start breaking up one thing and then you'll find something else and you want to jump straight onto that next one. And if you have to go back to the office and ask for a new um, instruction to the subcontractor and a new design and then approvals off everyone, it, it just takes years and costs <coughs> millions so. Yeah, it is a problem, but um, just go down there with your Sentinel card and don't tell people. <laughs> okay, uh, before the next question, there's a, an iPhone 12 just found down here on its own, so it's a white 12 mini. Hello, guys. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, my name is Tom McGowan. I work for Betty Consulting. So I have a bit of a design question for Ben and then a constructability question for both. Uh, the first, Ben, is given your design criteria and your loading and unloading situations, was there any kind of coordination, and I apologize if I missed this, with the station designers on whether they could build a transfer structure or something to avoid placing those constraints on the tunnel? Um, and then the second question is, Given the loading conditions that you had, do you think that the three curve SCL profile was the most efficient shape to deal with that? Um, and then full disclosure for the rest of the audience, I cut my teeth on rebar detailing on this project, so I <laughs> got a bit of a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, answer to the, to, to the last one. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was to reach a compromise between the, the structure performance and the, the space proofing. So, so at, at the end, when you design the design, uh, the, the a cross section of the tunnel, you need to bear in mind or to consider uh, many, many, many issues. The structural one is, it was the, one of the main ones. So, as far as we could, we we tried to to round the, the shape as much as we could. Uh, but at the end, yeah. Uh, we, we had to, to, to go for a higher reinforcement due to the fact that uh, the, the, the loading basically was not set uh, when we started the, the design. We were able to, to allow or to have some, some allowance to, to place reinforcement, and unfortunately, we, we, the, the reinforcement ratio, as, as Matt said, was, was quite high. Also, we, we tried uh, trying to optimize the, the section thickness and, and the 
and the performance, we tried also to engage the primary lining. However, at the end, it was considered that it wouldn't be a good idea to rely on the primary lining with such a preload and load. And therefore, the second line, the second lining had to take or had to be considered to take the 100% the of the loads in the uh, in the long term. About the transferring structure, I think it's a, or, or what, what I mentioned before about uh, being working with different parties at different design uh, stages. So when we needed to design that, that was meant to come way earlier than the than the the, the station the station basement. So we were looking into that, and we and I'm, I am aware that the designer of the of Houston station uh, was trying not to load the tunnel uh, as uh, too much. So there was some something some coordination in those regards. But at the end of the day, we had quite a considerable load that we had to, to consider and we have to lock that, uh, that load at some point in order for, to allow the design to, to advance. Uh, th thank you very much. Did, did you have it? Sorry, Ben. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess just thank you for the response. And uh, the other thing I just add as a, a learning point for us was that we didn't realize the number of issues we'd have with 9.9 shape codes on the tunnel. Um, so we kind of did the first draft of drawings, and we thought it was OK. And then JGL went and tried to procure it, and they told us that, that they couldn't, um, at least with all the other deadlines of Tideway and all the, everything else in COVID, because all the bars had to be hand bent, and just no one wanted to touch it. So in the end, JGL pulled up their socks and, and bent the bars themselves. So I just hats off to them, and maybe lesson learned is do as see if you can get rid of 99 codes from a from a design that that was where the double radius wasn't it yeah, yeah it was mainly the, the double radius bars um, which couldn't be bent automatically uh, so there were some health and safety issues and also it, just with covid and social distancing getting those bent by hand yeah i have to say i was pretty impressive when, when you go down and you see the people installing the reinforcement and, and how they did with that it was so yeah praise for them as well uh, it was very really impressive to see that person. Yeah, so yeah, good drawings too, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> good drawings, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Th thanks, for, thanks for saying that. I'm not sure it's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it, it was. <laughs> Andreas Weising at Dr. Sound Partners. Uh, one for Matt, these um, graphical storyboards, uh, I've seen them a lot. I think they're really good. Good is question. this something you do, or is this industry practice? Um, uh, <laughs> I started anyway. doing these. I, I joined a company called Scanmore, who've gone bust years ago. But they, in 2005, we started using them. They had a contract with Costain on the Shepherd's Bush White City shopping center. We had to do an overbuild to the to the uh, central line. And because we had to do so many presentations to TFL saying we're going to build this, you know, with live trains running through us, and we're not going to kill anyone or smash up any trains. Although we did rip the doors off one, but um, we started doing it then, and I've I've continued, and I do try and get everyone to share the love. I think some people have picked it up. But, uh, I, I think it's a great planning uh, tool, and it probably should uh, be used more. Uh, one question for Ben also, um, considering again the, the reinforcement amount and uh, we understand this, this unloading and reloading, did you consider longitudinal uh, construction joints as well? Because you mentioned mm -hmm. quite a lot of uh, vertical ones because of this uh, um, heave and, and settlement uh, as, uh, over, over the, the life of this uh, asset. Did you consider these longitudinal ones? I'm just wondering to, to make it more flexible and, and you know, uh, potentially install less reinforcement. No, we, we didn't consider that. Uh, <coughs> the reason is that we, the, fa the fact that we needed so much reinforcement, it was, I guess we had a lot of lap lapping um, distances and, and it's not also, it's not a common practice doing that in, in a casting situ. And it's also the, the rotation of the displacements are difficult to control. So, so we did uh, manage to, uh, with the differential, let's say, loading by instead of like installing reinforcement in the in the axis, uh, dealing that with allowing the structure to move gradually. 
and, and, and <coughs> actually, like not allowing the water to, to come in. But no, uh, we we deemed that the, the Nigerian Jones wasn't the, the solution for, for that, and <coughs> we have to, to provide the reinforcement to deal with the loads. Yeah, um, Asil from London Re Associates. Uh, I have a question regarding the st storyboards as well. So uh, just about the dynamo model that Ben used for his parametric modeling, uh, did you ever try to connect those two? No, it's, it, it, it's, it's really much more simple than that. <laughs> <coughs> the software I use is free to download off the internet. I implore all of you to download it this evening. It's called Inkscape, and you go to inkscape.org and download it for free. Um, it, it, the beauty of it is it's free off the internet, so you don't have to um, you don't have to convince anyone to buy it from the company. Although I did have to convince people just to install it now, um, but it's free. It's very simple to use, so you can pick it up within about twenty minutes, half an hour. Uh, but it does rely on going to PDFs. Uh, cut, cutting the drawings from those, scaling them down, and just tracing over them as a as a bitmap. But it, it it's, you just end up with vector graphics, so it doesn't use up too much space. So even if you've got a fairly rubbishy laptop, you'll be able to draw quite a few sketches with it. But the beauty of it is is that because it's simple, and because you can pick it up, your, your engineers, section engineers, agents, whoever's planning your works for you, they can they can go through the process themselves. If, if, you go, if you have a 3D CAD BIM team, everyone says, oh, yeah, it's great, you get this 3D drawing. But the problem is, you'll say, can you just check this? Th does this fit? And they'll go, yes, can you come back next week? And then you go back next week, and they say it didn't fit. And you're like, OK, can you try this? Oh, yeah, come back in two days. And it, it just goes on endlessly. And also, you need someone who's really good at using this software. Whereas if, if you do it yourself, you know, you just sit there playing with things. Does this fit? No. Okay, I'll try this. Well, okay, I'll try this machine. And quite often, um, you know, at Bank Station, we, we had to do this escalator going up. And I, um, it wasn't normal shotcrete where you dig and spray, dig and spray. It's like every single advance was different. It's different geometry, different machines also. But you, you know, there's 86 advances in this. Not one of them was the same. But you would, I'd, I'd work my way through and you, you get to advance 50 and you're like, oh, this doesn't work. So then you'd have to go back and you say, oh, if I change this thing I do at step 20, then uh, you know the, the problem isn't there at 50 anymore. So no, I don't um, try and do anything more complicated than that. It, it's basically in the old days, we used to get photocopies and scale them up on the photocopier before we had computers. And then we'd, we'd draw machines and cut them out with bits of paper and move them across the page. It's basically doing that, but uh, uh, you know, with with the computer, so you can do it an industrial scale. So yeah, it's very simple. Thank you. And just a question to Ben: Is just about bridging the gap between site and office in a way? Were you able to back integrate the storyboards into yours, or did you had a different formal way of taking design changes? Yeah, that's all about the debate about what is the what for you can use the the beam and the. 4D, 5D. Um, I, I think the gap is, is being quite, cl it's been close with, with that. Obviously, at the end, if you need something quick or to sketch something, a hand sketch or, or doing something in PDF, it is quicker. But, but we can see that in the projects that we, we are recently designing and it also in this, uh, we engage a lot of the contractor and and, you know, they were, they, they use our tools or they were using those tools to show them. Uh, or to, to justify things, or so I, I, I don't. I wouldn't say it's been a disconnection between the designer and the contractor, or the opposite. I think uh, we been we've been able to, to communicate with our digital tools or with hand sketches, uh, and at the end, bear in mind that we have a program and then we have a to, to get the things done in a, in a so you need to assess how long it will take and whether it's worth it to use a very um, say, mm, new tool. Or, or or basically go to something simple. So at the end, but yeah, I, I would say like the message is that, that in this project and in, in the, the ones that we are working at the moment, digital tools are really uh, being used and, and the contractor is quite engaged with that. So I think that's a good in the, we're in the good direction. Thank you. Great presentation, by the way. Thank you.
Yeah, hi, good presentation. Uh, Phil Astle, OTB. A question for Ben. Uh, was the re in the ULS state, was the rebar there for the, the final loading case, Houston, or was it there for the unloading case? And also, uh, was any of the rebar there for the uh, SLS performance of the tunnel? We we'll say yes to all. So, <laughs> for, uh, there was some rebar which was driven by the unloading, usually in the opposite direction where you have the rebar for the loading. And then, yeah, the, the crack width uh, was uh, another issue as well. So, so I would say like uh, all of those aspects brought us to to that final quantity of, of reinforcement. So I would I would I wouldn't say that it was a, a clear <coughs> driver in the reinforcement. It was a combination of, of the extreme situations that we that we had. Okay, you're right. Uh, crack width, you've got a waterproof lining. Why was that taken into account? Yeah, that, that's also interesting. Uh, so crack width is not on, only about water, it's also about the, the environment. So you have the air there. Uh, the, this crack width is more, uh, you, you have also the standards that we need to comply. And, and there's always a, a debate about whether the standards or, in each, or not only the codes, but the standards of the clients uh, are, are, are detailing up the issue. Uh, however, we had to design for the crack width, which was required. There's a debate, I agree, whether that is the, the most um, the, the, the clear number of, or, or also if you have a membrane or you expect a dry environment, whether you need to restrict the crack width to the limits or to the levels that, that they give us. Um, but yeah, we, we had to, to design according to the, the codes and, and standards. Uh, Liam Gabriel from Jay Murphy and Sons. Uh, question for you, Matt, storyboard. Mm -hmm. um, only joke. I'm, I'm glad only joke. so much interest. <laughs> I noticed in your presentation you had many different parties that you were working with for loads of different stages. Two part, really. Have you had the opportunity to speak together and take lessons from your working arrangements and discuss collaboratively of what would be the way forward if you were to approach something like this in the future? And then Second, what's your biggest takeaway from this scheme that you'd like to have the opportunity to do again? Okay, so um, all the different parties. Um, I think that with this one, because it, it, it was from, yeah, handed over from Costain as well, so it, it would have been slightly different to the rest of the project. But I think everyone spoke together really well. There was... Uh, there's also, we already have a relationship with TFL. And, you know, it's, it's a small community, so you, you get to meet the same people time and time again. So from that side of things, um, yes, I, I, I wrote a lessons learned document at the end, but uh, shared it with a few people. But it's not like we sat down in a room because as we went through the project, we were you know, constantly Shared speaking people. to everyone. And then what was your other question? Did you get the opportunity again? Oh. <laughs> I think it went it, it, it went really well you know we had Gallagher's on board they, they had some really good people they uh, you know they produced a really good quality product um, you know we had the design from Mott's we, we had a good relationship with them backwards and forwards with the design you know, we had a weekly meeting we had uh, staff on site uh, that we would resolve so um Really don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. As you say that, I Matt, really can't think. Of Matt told me the other day that business. it was the easiest project or the, the smoothest project you've ever been involved. Then I told him that that was because there was well, a, a good design. I would go management. Yeah, no, it, 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 it did go well. The, and it, it was fairly simple project. You know, it's 100 meters long with a couple of connections on the end. But, uh, but with the with the yeah. team that we had and engaged, it was, everything went. <laughs> Yeah, it was a it was it was a gold benchmark. Yeah. Okay, so f uh, we is it a quick one? Okay, let's have one more. Hi, Matt. Um, Ed, Transport for London. I hope you can put your uh, LU prejudices to one side. Um, yeah, it's just a quick one about carbon modelling. Um, 
I was wondering, firstly, what software packages you decided to go for with the, with the modeling, and secondly, was the drive um, or the initiative, did, did that come from the design side or did that come from the client? Well, it, it's, it's HS2 and it's government projects, so just morally, um, yeah, it's just us, it's just what we do really. Um, yeah, everyone thinks that everything's really difficult, but it's, it's, it's really simple. I had a spreadsheet <laughs> from our environmental people that told us how much a ton of steel carbon was, how much a ton of concrete was, and uh, you know, a, a, a delivery vehicle was. Um, so basically, it was it was just adding up that it was. Uh, you know, may maybe if you went into the BIM models and you had a more complicated structure, you'd, you'd need to use something uh, a, l a lot more sophisticated. But no, it, it, was, it was just a piece of paper with this is how much is on and went through it myself. But um, yeah, I, I, I think just everyone, yeah, it, it's the same with safety. You know, ev everyone's got a moral duty to make sure that we uh, design and construct a safe product. Um, and I think with carbon, people should be thinking the same way. That's it then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Matt, Ben. Um, then we have the sponsored bar, and it's very fun. <laughs> A few announcements we need to, to make before we go to the, to the bar and further continue with the questions. So if I can get the slides, please, or the pointer. Yes, as I've told you, the drinks are sponsored by Maestro Gatos. Thank you very much. And the food is from Mott Mac. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, BTS annual dinner is coming up next week. And uh, yeah, I think uh, an email has been sent about uh, better requirements. We need to yeah, so if you've booked a table, um, then if you can send your dietary requirements as requested by John Scully by end of today or tomorrow morning, that'll be great. But we've also got uh, some availability for tables and individual spaces still remaining. So if you haven't booked yet but still want and don't want to miss out on the fun, uh, there's still time to book. Excellent. Thanks, David. Yeah, next coming up is on the 25th of May. Uh, we have a workshop, in-person workshop. Um, titled Low Carbon Spread Concrete, Maximizing the Potential for Carbon Reductions. Um, you need to apply for that. Uh, a form has been sent out, so please do apply. Yeah, uh, the time has come, World Tunneling Congress. Uh, so there's a call out for working group attendees. Well, um, you can find this in your newsletter and um, also you can see the working group sessions on the program, on the web website of the Congress. And on the 8th of June, we have our next BTS Young Members Lecture. Uh, it's going to be delivered by a representative from uh, uh, Highways England on uh, road tunnels operation. BTS Annual Gathering and May Meeting on the 25th of May, North Bristol Relief Sewer Project. And the BTS June meeting on the 15th of June, design of watertight structures. Uh, can we rely on the self filling of cracks in concrete? Oh, that's interesting. And of course, we are going to hold the BTS Young Members Conference on the 29th of September. Uh, this is going to be not in the IC, but in the Arab offices. In um, and please do keep an eye out. We will be rolling our uh, paper applications and uh, poster applications as well as a program. Yeah, and of course, if you want to present your project or research, please do contact Ben or Richard. Their are emails in there. The BTS Design and Construction course this summer, 3rd of July until the 7th at Warwick University. Bookings open, so there is an early booking discount available until the 30th of April. Uh, a really interesting one. And uh, 
there are sponsored places for students and apprentices. Uh, and see website and uh, course flyer, or speak to Mike King, his email on the screen. And that's all. Thank you.